Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me back for a second talk. Uh, <laughs> After the first one, and I guess uh, it really means that people are uh, really uh, interested in learning about what we can do with uh, X-ray free electron lasers. Um, you know, the LCLS at Stanford came online about four years ago now, and we can focus 10 to the 12 photons in either a one micron focus or a 100 nanometer focus in 40 femtoseconds. So what can we do with that? And um, I'll just highlight a couple of projects I've been involved with. Um, one thing we can do is to target really small crystals. So uh, this is a, a collaboration with David Eisenberg at UCLA and Ilma Schlichting. Um, and the crystals are actually growing inside bacterial cells. As part of its life cycle, this bacillus um, forms a spore. And then this crystal is um, made of an insecticidal um, protein. It's a delta endotoxin um, against the cottonwood leaf beetle. And it's actually um, isolated uh, in pure form as an agricultural product, um, as an insecticide. Um, but we just want to be able to see if we can actually look at crystal structures inside living cells. Um, actually, we cheated a little bit. For this project, we took an engineered strain where the crystal size actually grows to about one micron cubed. Um, now, there, there was another crystal structure solved recently of cathepsin B. That's a, a cysteine protease from propanosome, the protozoan from the African sleeping sickness. And that was solved to high resolution at an expel source. But in that case, the crystals which grew inside the cells were actually isolated first um, and then uh, exposed to the beam. We did it both ways here. We looked at crystals that were actually in living cells and isolated from living cells. And we got the structure both ways. So just a few experimental details. Um, for this type of experiment, the samples are delivered to the x-rays with a liquid jet. It's focused, uh, in this case, by a, um, a sheath of helium gas. The samples go in at a, you know, a fairly high clip, 10 microliters per minute. I think, if you do the math on this, we use one milliliter of sample. We use, that's 100 billion crystals. Um, altogether um, at a rate of, of about 120 pulses per second. Um, so if you do the math on that, actually 14,000 crystals were consumed with each pulse. So it's actually a very wasteful technique. Um, in the end, we took 30,000 diffraction patterns from these cells and integrated the data. And there's a paper coming out soon in PNAS. So I'll, that's all I'll say about this project for now, unless there are questions at the end. The other uh, one that I'm involved with, um, this is a collaboration among many groups because as you'll see, there's a lot of different expertise that went into the project. Um, the PI on this is Vidal Yacondra, also at Berkeley Labs. We're looking at Photosystem 2. That's the protein in green leaves that's responsible for taking water and splitting it um, to create oxygen. That's the oxygen in our atmosphere and it releases um, hydrogen. It's the energy from this is um, in the green leaf, it's uh, put into the carbon fixation process. But there's great interest in this process um, among, for example, material scientists who want to understand how this is catalyzed. It's actually, we're collecting four photons from sunlight, storing them in the protein in the, in the form of this manganese complex which starts out at a certain oxidation state, and then it accumulates positive charge. It's sort of like a battery. Um, and then at one point in the cycle, uh, the water is split. Um, and, of course, this charge has to be stabilized by the surrounding amino acids in the protein. And, you know, it is hoped that we can, if we understand the process, how it advances around the redox cycle, we could take design principles from this and apply it to the construction of new materials which would perform um, synthetic um, photosynthesis. So that's sort of the motivation behind this. But it's been very difficult to get a handle on this process with X-ray crystallography. So it, it's sort of been well known now for about maybe eight years or ten years that um, just a very small dose of X-rays, far below this 30 megagray threshold that we often talk about, 
just a small a fraction of that can damage the very thing that we're interested in is the structure of the manganese. It's, it's, uh, it's photo-reduced um, when you hit it with a little bit of x-rays. Now, you can cryo-freeze um, some of these intermediate states and get some structural information on that basis. But, for example, when you get to this state, you can no longer trap these intermediates. This actually has to be studied in a time-dependent process at room temperature. So there's really no chance of studying this whole evolution um, at room temperature at a synchrotron, thus the interest in x uh here. So this is how the experiment is performed. We've, we've actually been working on this for a few years now. There's, um, there's an injector that injects a stream of crystals uh, in a liquid jet into the interaction zone. Um, in the process of going through this capillary, we irradiate the crystals with a green laser, either once, twice, or three times to advance the system to those different states in the redox cycle. Um, then they're probed with x-rays, and we actually do two experiments from a single x-ray pulse. First, we get crystallography diffraction in order to look at whether there's changes in the manganese positions, and that's one experiment. And at the same time, we're irradiating with x-rays that are just above the manganese absorption edge. So we're getting x-ray emission from the K-beta line of the manganese. So this emission spectrum is then collected at sort of right angles and analyzed, the dispersion is analyzed on this detector here. We get a spectrum. I'll show it on the next slide here. Oh, this is, this is a whole other story in data processing that was almost just as difficult as diffraction. This is a single shot. We can't see anything here. But, in fact, if we add up 10,000 shots from different crystals, we actually can see the dispersion along the energy axis of the emitted signal from the manganese, and then we condense it into a one-dimensional spectrum and <coughs> calibrate it against energy. Uh, this is what we get. So it turns out that the K-beta emission line is very sensitive to the oxidation state of the manganese. So remember, this is what we want to know. We want to know if the x-rays in the 40 femtosecond period have damaged the manganese um, or... In, a, in this period of time, does the manganese remain intact, and can we really study what we want to study? And the answer is the latter. It, it really works. Um, so that's shown in sort of this panel here. So let's look at what we're doing here. So in green and blue, these two curves that are overlapping, this is the signal from photosystem 2 at room temperature studied with x belts on top of a synchrotron structure or synchrotron experiment that had to be performed at 8 degrees Kelvin in order to keep the manganese intact. So in this oxidation state, the manganese is a combination of plus 3 and 4. Whereas in this curve, this is the synchrotron at room temperature where the manganese is reduced to manganese 2, and it's also on top of a black curve. This is manganese chloride. It's our standard for knowing what the plus 2 state is. So this just shows the dark state of photosystem 2. It shows that we can do the experiment, and it's going to take a lot of more data acquisition to actually look at all the intermediate states that we hope to, to look at. So actually, that's all I'm going to talk about, about the photosystem science. The rest of the talk is what were the challenges uh, for X-ray diffraction in actually taking this data and processing it. So taking the data for one thing, um, you know, this happens at 120 images per second, but at the XL line, we're, we're asking the same questions that you are when you take your sample to the synchrotron. And we had 20 different batches of protein. Is batch number four good enough to collect the whole data set, or do we have to go into batch number five? But we have to get these answers in near real time. So this just shows, as a function of, I think, a five-minute period, this is a control with thermalysin just to develop the methods. So for a couple of minutes, this plots the number of Bragg spots on each image. So there weren't very many crystals, then a lot of crystals came through, and then there weren't so many after that. So uh, we, we do this kind of hit finding first, and then for the successful images, the ones that look like they had Bragg spots, we then go on to index and integrate them. Another reason to look at data right away, or as a filtering step, 
these are three consecutive shots uh, where we've looked at the spectrum of the incoming x-rays. And actually, one thing you notice here is the x-rays aren't monochromatic. There's a dispersion, and the bandwidth is maybe about 0.5%. Um, we're going to be doing an experiment this month where we actually try to use seeding techniques to get a, a really monochromatic um, incident pulse. And there, we're going to have to measure the spectrum and sort of in real time filter out filter those events that really have a monochromatic pulse and just process that data. So how do we organize all this? Um, it's really a partnership with the data acquisition team at Slack. We're, we're collecting 120 images per second, and these are being written to a file. We pick up the data after it's already been written to a file. Uh, consecutive images are put this into, this red line is a representation of a serial access file that, rep that contains all the images. But there's actually six of them. And the data is put in, consecutive events are in, uh, they're, they're deposited in sort of a round robin um, fashion into the files. So when we then go to analyze the data, we can have separate hosts working on each of the six files. And that spreads out the computation load. And the other thing is that the hosts themselves each have about 12 nodes in them. So we can multiply six hosts by 12 CPUs and we can analyze 66 or 72 images at once. Um, and that is the only way we can actually analyze the data in near real time. So that's, that's speed. And then simple, simply getting enough processors to do that. We actually needed 1,000 CPU cores uh, sometimes we can do that at Slack by reserving these cores ahead of time. Uh, other times, this is what we did a year ago. We actually reserved access to machines at NERSC. Does anyone know what NERSC is? It's a, it's a DOE lab. It's famous for things like cosmology and climatological simulations. But they're interested in getting into the data analysis business. So we transferred. This is showing over a five-day period. We acquired 100 14 terabytes of data, and we shipped it over the internet to NERSC. And so the blue curve is the acquisition of the data, and the, the yellow curve is transferring it to NERSC. And for some of the experimental periods, we actually kept up really well. Other ones, we lagged behind by as much as 12 hours. But the, the networking people went back afterwards, and they could actually troubleshoot and figure this out. So the next time we do this, we're really going to get the data from Stanford to Oakland, California in near real time. And this is at 10 gigabits per second. And this just shows this is the total internet traffic going into and out of NERSC during that five day period. And this is the incoming traffic from our photosystem experiment. So we really dominated uh, the internet access uh, to NERSC during that period of time. So that's really all I'm gonna say about sort of scale up. And <laughs> The rest of the talk is about, you know, how do we actually look at the diffraction? And, the, you know, I anticipate cat calls from, from Kai Dieterich here. Um, you know, <laughs> this is the same situation that we know about from general crystallography. The signal that we're looking for is almost always um, overwhelmed by the background. The signal is down here, except for very low resolution, very intense brag spots. Otherwise, the background signal is, is higher than, than, than the Bragg signal. So we always are in a situation where we have to develop models that really zero in on exactly the pixels that we're interested in and ignore the surrounding, or subtract off the background signal from the surrounding. Um, but when we started doing this two years ago, so these are, remember, this is 40 femtoseconds. So every shot we're taking is a still shot. So we're using an algorithm like uh, Mossum does with either profile fitting or uh, simple summation of a 2D pattern. Uh, but this is the results that we started getting when we first did this. Here's the Bragg spot in white. The integration mask is in blue, and it's only slightly overlapping. Most of what we're integrating here is background signal or just zeros. And, of course, when we're doing SPL studies, we observe the same Bragg spot potentially hundreds of times. So we collected the 109, 679 times, and we did a histogram. And, you know, what do you want to see? You want to see a nice Gaussian distribution 
with a mean that's uh, reflective of the structure factor intensity and a, a sigma that represents experimental error. We don't see that at all. The distribution is mostly zero. So if you start asking me what's my shot noise and what's my systematic, everything is systematic error here. And I can't even start to write a formula uh, like you did before that's going to tell me um, how to treat the data. We've spent the last two or three years just troubleshooting different sources of experimental error. So that's pretty much the rest of the talk. So the first thing is we have to look at the detector. Um, this is what the detector looks like. It's a pixel array detector. Um, it's similar in design to what we've heard about before, where there's a silicon sensor and then it's bump on it to... Um, an ASIC circuit, an application-specific integrated circuit that actually uh, integrates the signal in the pixel. Um, but this is not a commercial product. There is no product on the market that would let us integrate the signal over a 40 frames a second period and then report it out 120 times per second all the time with the electronics in vacuum. There's simply no other product. This is a home-built detector um, uh, between Slack and Cornell, um, and as such, we had to put up with a few little quirks. So, for example, um, this is the construction. These are silicon, uh, I don't remember, I think they're amorphous silicon. There are 32 of them. They're formed into quadrants. The quadrants actually move apart so the direct beam can go through the center of the detector. This is all done in vacuum. Moreover, these sensors are field serviceable. So that's important because sometimes the x-rays kill the silicon and you have to replace the sensor. But as a consequence, look at the way I've drawn it here. Some of them are tilted, they may be translated out of place. We don't know exactly where they are. We don't have a factory calibration. So <laughs> as a result, we have to really look at this closely. So this is just um, a data set, I think it's life design, where we've added up thousands of images together and we get sort of a virtual powder pattern. And we, the first thing we need to do is adjust the quadrants so that the lysozyme, you know, the expected powder pattern from lysozyme fits with the data. So we actually develop, we do this by hand. We developed a, a GUI where we just uh, shift using a little spin box here where the positions of the quadrants are so they approximately line up. And we can get this within maybe a pixel or two. But as you saw on the first slide of this series, a, a two-pixel error is terrible because we won't be in the right place to integrate the signal. So we have, to, we have to drill down and do better. So for looking at where each sensor is, we start where Slack provides information ahead of time where they actually scan the quadrants with an electron microscope. So we know exactly where the silicon is. We don't exactly know where the ASIC chip is underneath and we can't observe it. But it turns out that the fraction, sort of like I showed before, is a good way to calibrate all of these things. So uh, we can just take, let's say, either a lysozyme or we did it with thermolysin. We get a diffraction pattern over all of the sensors, and then we just plot. This is a scatter plot of predicted position of the spot based on the model from indexing versus where we actually observe the spot. And this scatter plot shows that for this readout, we really need to move it over about 0.6 pixels in this direction to get it to be the right place. So it's just the same thing we've been talking about for two days. We do nonlinear least squares positional optimization of these tiles. So we're, we're minimizing this function, the observed minus calculated positions. And not only do we rotate and translate the tiles, but we also optimize the crystal rotation and unit cell dimensions for each crystal. So there's about 100,000 parameters we're optimizing in this thing. And in the end, we can get the positions to about 10 microns. So that's good. Um, now, as I indicated, this is sort of a, a hierarchical organization of the detector. So the detector is at a particular position and has an orientation, and then we get in orientation and position for the quadrants, and then the sensor, and then the ASIC tiles. So it's a, a hierarchy. Once we've calibrated this all, we want to write out the data so that in the future we can go back and process the data again, knowing the exact calibration information that we have. So Herbert Bernstein 
this is where he comes into the, he, he um, is providing the software that lets us write a header in a standard format that's accepted sort of internationally that encodes all of this information. So, and then this is a modification of the slide I showed before. Not only are we using CCTBX as the toolkit for dials, but actually XFELs as well. And XFELs came a little, you know, about a year or two before dials. So we actually wrote all this code to do the integration for XFELs first. And now that dials is developed, we're, um, we're more or less merging things together. And it's important to do that because dials is sort of written in a more general way. Remember I talked about these models before. So one of the things we'd like to do with XFELs is have a, a a source and a crystal that are the same, and yet have two detectors. It turns out, remember I told you there was a hole in the middle of the pad detector. And the photons can go, actually the low angle brag spots can go right through the hole in the front detector. And then we have a back detector two and a half meters behind that. So we can actually get the measurement of the 001. But we can't do it with our XFEL software. But we can much more easily do it with dials. And, and the dials framework we can sort of mix and match these models. We can have any number of detectors that are linked up to uh, a source and a crystal. We could even have multiple crystals as well. So the two projects are merging together. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about errors and where they come from and how we're trying to deal with them. Uh, as you might imagine, thousands of crystals, each one of them is a different quality. So some diffract to four angstroms, some to two. But if you have four angstrom bright spots that you're using to find the orientation of the crystal through the indexing process, well, the model that you come up with based on those four angstrom spots is really going to be only predicting the spots to about four angstroms. If you want to extend it to try to find weak spots at two angstroms, the model isn't very good. Um, so we decided that this was one of the reasons we're integrating a lot of zero intensities, because we're trying to push the model too far. So what we decided to do is just for every image, we do a Wilson plot, and we look at where the data falls off, and we cut the data off differently, different resolution cutoffs, depending on where the Wilson plot intersects with the average noise. And for this data set, we cut it off at about for 2.4 angstroms. Then, when we take the thousands of data sets, the way we put them all together is, well, first of all, we scale each image separately against a reference data set collected out of synchrotron. All of the structures we've looked at so far are already known, and there are synchrotron data sets. So it's sort of fudging things a bit, but we, we do scaling, and then the merging process is simply averaging multiple measurements from the same HKL. But because we cut off the data differently for different crystals, at low resolution we have many crystals and very high multiplicity of observations. And then at some point there's very few lattices that we merge together and very low multiplicities, here only 2.4. So how do we decide when we go into protein refinements, what, what is the resolution limit we use for that? So for that, we're sort of borrowing the ideas from Karplus and Diederichs um, from a couple of years ago. We start sort of conservatively at a low resolution. We do structure refinement there. And then we consecutively add higher and higher shells um, of data. And we continue until we reach a point where the R3 no longer goes down. And so in this case, for thermal isen, uh, as a consequence of that, we cut the data off at 2.1 angstroms. Uh, we've since collected higher resolution than that on thermal isen. So that's resolution. The other thing is that, as I said before, uh, images can have two lattices. Um, this one, there's a lattice out to about 2.3, I think, and this one in blue is about 3.8. Um, it's actually easy enough to index these. We simply take the bright spots, put them into a 1D FFT indexing algorithm. The dominant lattice comes out of that, and then we use that model to predict where all the spots are, and we take away 
those predicted spots from this collection that we're using, and then use the remaining spots to index the second lattice. So that's what we do. That comes out of Label It, and that's what we're using so far. Dials actually has um, a different algorithm that Richard Gildia just implemented. So here, um, this is actually this is real data from a synchrotron. It, it turns out it has six diffraction patterns. I don't know why. Yeah, there it is. Um, and he indexes them all at the same time using an extra bit of information that they're all from the same type of crystal. They all have the same unit cell, which is known ahead of time. Um, so he can just look for that for instances of that unit cell in the periodicity of the data. So it's sort of a direct method. Um, and this is, uh, this is just recently. So this will probably be uh, put into the Expel software as well. Now, as a consequence of looking at um, thousands of crystals, it turns out 28% of crystal structures have a space group where the, the, the lattice symmetry is higher than the space group symmetry. So what does that mean? This is um, an example, polyhedra crystals. This is a collaboration with David Stewart, where the space group is I23, but the lattice actually has an additional symmetry element that's not part of the space group. So it's a two-fold on the face diagonal. It could equivalently be described as the four-fold axis of, of the cube. Um, so as a consequence, with two crystals together, you could index them together as up and up or up and down, okay? So since we have a lot of crystals together to merge, we have n crystals. There are two to the n minus one mutual indexing possibilities. This is a big problem. This is an astronomical number, but it's a problem that was solved by Bremen Dieters um, earlier this year. Um, there's a nice paper. And what they use is for pairs of images, they simply look at the correlation there's um, on two, two imagers, there are bound to be some Miller indices that are shared, maybe only 10 or 20. But you look at those Miller indices and you calculate the correlation coefficient, the intensities that you measure. And if they're both indexed mutually in the same orientation, it's a high correlation coefficient. Otherwise, it's a low correlation coefficient. And then you construct this sort of abstract mathematical plot where each point represents one crystal lattice, and then you simply move around these points in this abstract space such that pairs of crystals that have high correlation are close together and otherwise are pushed apart. And like magic, they sort out into two groups. So we can just color this group red and re-index it using this um, using this um, symmetry operator, and then we can merge the data like that. So that's uh, multi-crystal averaging. Now, um, the other thing to know about still images is that they're actually hard to index. You can index them, but the orientation you get is not very accurate. So this is a, a place to test your understanding of reciprocal space. If this is the crystal and this is the diffraction pattern, if I rotate around the z-axis, what happens to the diffraction pattern? It just rotates in lockstep with the crystal. What if I rotate it around the x or the y-axis? Anybody know what happens to the diffraction pattern? Uh, the spots don't change position at all. Some spots come into the Ewald sphere and out or out of the Ewald sphere, so the, the number of spots changes but the position of the spots on the detector does not change. But yet, remember when we were, when we were refining our model, we used the position of spots as a basis to get the orientation. But what this tells us is that we cannot refine the X and Y rotations um, using this target function that I showed before. So instead, we have to go to the sort of, it's more abstract here, we have to refine an additional term so what this term is, this delta psi angle, this is a, a picture of reciprocal space. The gold reciprocal lattice points are the ones that we actually observe on the image. And delta psi is the angle, separate angle for each spot that we would need to get that spot exactly on the Ewald sphere. And we're simply trying to minimize the, the, the delta psi angle over the entire data set. 
So we get a better orientation if we add in this additional term. In fact, we did some simulated studies where instead of getting a misorientation of 0.08 degrees, we reduce that to 0.02 degrees if we added this term. And as you might imagine, it's important for understanding, for modeling which spots we actually observe and to go and integrate those spots on the data. Now, I, I <coughs> skipped a little bit of a step when I talked about this. Remember I said the spots weren't exactly on the Ewald sphere, but we still observe them. And how, how is that possible? The answer, of course, is that crystals are disordered. So if you think about how would you draw a picture of mosaicity in reciprocal space? The way you draw it is that um, the crystal is made of mosaic domains that have different, slightly different orientations. So in reciprocal space, the reciprocal lattice point is smeared out um, tangentially around the origin of reciprocal space. So higher resolution spots, that's these spots over there, have very large arclets in my drawing. But look at what this predicts. So when you get to low angle resolution, these low resolution spots, since the arclets are smaller here, there are fewer low resolution spots observed on the image. But that's not actually what we see um, in real diffraction patterns from the X-Bell. There's just as many low resolution spots as high resolution. So I have to draw a slightly different picture. Here, I draw all the reciprocal lattice points the same size, and the size is determined by the block size in the mosaic model of the crystal. Each block has a different size, and it represents the, the, the volume over which the x-rays are diffracted coherently. So the Fourier transform of that is the size of the spot in reciprocal space. And I actually, I combine these two models. I just add up these two effects together to properly predict which spots I observe um, in the fraction. So this actually, okay, so uh, this, this allows me to more properly model which spots I see, but there's something I've already skipped over, and that is um, normally in rotation data sets, we bring the spot through the Ewald sphere by rotation, and that's how we measure a full rag intensity. But in x work, we're slicing through the reciprocal lattice point. We're only getting a partial measurement of the intensity. So I have to have some way of correcting for this to sort of compensate and divide through by a factor that would, that would correct each measurement I make to the full spot equivalent. And there is no accepted theory for doing that. I think a lot of people have ideas, and it's sort of a hot debate um, at conferences. So here's just a simple idea. Let's take the size of this spot. So this spot is a little bit far away from the Ewald sphere, so I'm not going to measure a very intense um, spot. This one, however, will be at its maximum. So I, I'm just thinking about a function that starts at zero, and then as you rotate into the Ewald sphere, conceptually, you measure first not very much, then you measure a lot, then not very much again. So I just use functions of this form as a sort of rough estimate for how I can correct for partiality. And when I do that, I get a better data set when I finally merge the reflections together. And the way I know that is not by propagating errors in some way, but by looking at statistics um, about the intensities, it's similar to what we saw yesterday with the E values, so I calculate three different kinds of statistics. These are the same types of statistics that we normally look at when we want to look for twinning in a data set. But here, we're not looking for twinning. We're simply looking for data that sort of look like the distribution of intensities that we expect from the Wilson statistics that was worked out in the 1950s. So I, I know roughly what the statistics should tell me, the theoretical value of this high test should be two. And then it turns out, uh, if I scale the data without any correction for partiality, it looks poor, it's 1.5. When I add this rough partiality correction, I get 1.7. And the same is true with this L test that was introduced by Gates, uh, um, I don't know, about 10 years ago, to look at, um, to look at twin crystals. 
So is that clear? I mean, I'm get, getting better statistics if I do a partiality correction. Now, we're, the CCTBX is not the only software for doing this. Other data sets have been processed with CRISPR. So this is a list of all high-resolution data sets from XFEL sources that have been published. The only one processed with our software here is Thermolysin, and here it's corrected for partiality. So there's a lot of numbers here. Let me try to highlight what I've done. For each structure, I'm giving the intensity statistics calculated on the XFEL data set that's shaded, and then on a similar synchrotron data set. So synchrotron data sets all behave fairly well um, in agreement with what we expect from theory. So the, the I test is about uh, 2.0, the deviation of the NZ distribution is about zero, and the L test is about 0.5. So in contrast, if you look at the merged data from XBELs, all the statistics are pretty bad. Um, my program is no exception here. Um, the one data set I think that stands out as being actually pretty close to what we expect theoretically is the Cathepsin B, solved at 2.1 angstroms. And the really special thing about that data set, as far as I can see, is that massive multiplicity. They measured every Brax spot 7,000 times. <laughs> I mean, we're, we were, you know, we're maybe going up to a thousand, but you know, it's a factor of seven difference. So I think that's the situation where we are now. We, um, we're trying to develop methods that would allow us to correct for these systematic errors um, and thereby get away with integrating data sets that are far smaller than they did with the TEPS and B. But right now, with the theory the way it is, we have to measure Bragg spot 7,000 times to get statistics that would be comparable to synchrotron data. It's, it's a lot of data, and you can't really do that with sort of precious samples that are very fragile, and it's also hard to get expel time. So that's sort of a snapshot of where we are. Now, as you see, I'm being pretty tentative about this. You know, I say that I have a method for correcting for partiality, but it's not giving me fantastic statistics. And there's still more stuff that I haven't mentioned, and that's... That has to do with the wavelength. Remember I showed the spectrum of the x-rays we're using. It's not exactly monochromatic. It's, it's fairly dispersed. And the shape of the spectrum is stochastic. It's different for every pulse. Uh, so in the next couple of slides, Aaron Brewster and my group sort of drew some Ewald sphere diagrams to show what the effect of this is. So this is just the picture. This is a, um, this is a spot on the Ewald sphere. We observed this spot um, further on on a detector that's out here somewhere. But when we have a dispersed beam, you actually have to draw many Ewald spheres. So here's the low energy Ewald sphere and the high energy limit Ewald sphere. So any reciprocal lattice point that's within this zone is going to be illuminated and we'll observe it on the detector. So now let's add the effect of mosaicity. Remember I said a mosaic crystal, we, re we represent the spots as little arclets. So for this monochromatic diagram, only this part of the arclet is illuminated. The rest of the spot is not observed. Now let's combine these two things. So now we have a dispersed uh, spectrum and a mosaic crystal. So now part of this, this sort of part gives us an angular distribution. This spreads out the spot in the radial direction. And sure enough, when we look at real data from thermolysin, spots that are very close together on the detector have very different um, sizes. This spot is seven pixels long. This spot is only two pixels long. And the reason is that some of these spots, like this one, the full arclet is immersed within the two wavelengths that mark the boundaries of the incident pulse whereas this spot is only partially immersed, so this would be the two pixel. And we're only beginning to start modeling this. So I hope this is a useful idea. Um, this, I think we worked it out numerically on this one image, but we don't generally have software that models this. But this is the direction we think we have to be headed in in order to uh, model the data. This is a result of this 
trying out different parameters for mosaicity and, and spectral dispersion. So, a couple slides uh, in conclusion on results. For thermal isen, we can actually measure an anomalous signal, and if we calculate a difference Fourier map, the anomalous peak height is 18 sigma on the zinc atom. Um, that's fairly respectable. We can locate the zinc in a in a Patterson map, but we can't. It's not the signal isn't strong enough for phasing at present. So hopefully, with better you know processing techniques, uh, this will be the signal will be enhanced. And it is a difficult phasing problem even on a synchrotron. But this is kind of where we're headed. We want to be aiming for this target. Um, for the photosystem too, that's a. It's obviously going to be a. It's a huge protein, so the four manganese cluster isn't going to give us a large signal, but it's still a six sigma peak, um, and it sort of. Um, it lets us really know for sure that we really had the manganese there, um, because remember we were, we were always worried about radiation damage. The dose we get is is enormous here. The thing that's really limited us in getting results from the photosystem too is the resolution. Um, we've only been able to get crystals to diffract out to between four and a half and five angstroms. So even though we've looked at different illumination states, the dark and uh, hitting it with different green laser pulses to advance the redox cycle, if we look at where the manganese is, we just see a blob. And we figured in data like this, we can't see changes in the manganese positions that are less than 0.5 angstroms. So we're working very hard, and we actually got some data this year where we got diffraction beyond 4.5. So next time I talk to you, maybe I'll have some uh, higher resolution maps where we could actually see manganese uh, changing position. So this, that was the anomalous map, a similar results with an FO minus FC map where we've omitted the manganese cluster from, uh, from the model and we get it, we get the position back at the green <coughs> spots. So just the last slide. Where are we now in terms of data processing? We really had to work hard to carefully adjust the model so that it tightly conforms to the pixels that we believe have the signal in them. So we had to refine the metrology of the detector. Uh, apply different resolution cutoffs, and index several lattices per image. Um, in the future, we want to get a better model for correcting partiality and fully account for the wavelength dispersion that I discussed, or simply use monochromatic pulses uh, that we're also working on producing. And, you know, I think it's clear that we're not where we want to be, and we have to be really careful developing new methods. So the guidepost that shows us the way is really the quality metrics on the data. So we want to look at the RMSD, how well do we predict where the spot is versus where we actually see it, and how many spots that we integrate really have zero intensity and we're just integrating noise, and do the intensities follow Wilson statistics that we expect, and how high is the anomalous signal. So this is, this is what we're looking for. There are many collaborators um, on these projects. So we got a lot of um, help from folks at LCLS. We're doing various projects with not only the Dials group at Diamond, but with um, David Eisenberg at UCLA, uh, other folks at Brookhaven National Lab, um, Axel Brunger at Stanford, and Mike Saltis at SSRL, also in the selecting environment. So thanks for your attention.